Hey, Anuj, uh, what is Data Herald? Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, super excited for this, and uh, let's see let's see where this goes. Uh, Data Herald, uh, in a sentence, uh, helps companies use AI to create content that is both data intensive, includes like a lot of data in it in the text, as well as use of visuals. So we help companies create data heavy content that automatically includes charts, maps, and graphs. That is what we do in a nutshell. Uh, we do have a focus on uh, the real estate and prop tech industry because of the experience we have and data sources we, we have um, uh, at the moment. Okay, so if I'm to be your client, I'm in real estate, uh, what do I do? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a couple examples of what we do really well uh, is we work with um, uh, a lot of real estate and prop tech companies to create, I think, what most people know or can be commonly called as Zillow style landing pages. So I think most people are pretty familiar with typing in your address into the internet, <laughs> into Chrome. And what you're basically surfaced with is a uh, page that's unique to your address. What you and I both know is that web page was not created by any single human typing in your Zestimate and your school score or anything like that. That page was really created uh, programmatically, uh, basically connecting structured data and creating content from it. So text, charts, graphs, all that stuff. So what you can think about what Data Herald does, at least in part, is help companies create all types of content, which I can talk about a little bit later. But one example is programmatic landing pages. And um, what we basically do is Zillow style landing pages kind of on steroids, so to speak. So we combine, we're able to both use connective structured data as well as LLMs to create both the text and visuals that comprise content such as landing pages. We also do that for uh, um, uh, offering memorandums and slides, um, ads, uh, blog posts, so on and so forth. So wherever you need content to tell a story, we can help you do that by merging an LLM plus data uh, to make that scalable, substantive, factual, so on and so forth. Yeah, we, we face this problem ourselves because we have a lot of data. Yeah. And we wanted, we saw very early on, I think before we launched the opportunity of turning it into different ways of generating top of funnel traffic. Yeah. And when we actually wanted to do it, turn our data into dynamic pages. Uh, we just didn't figure out how. Yeah. Um, because it seemed as complex as building our building the underlying data behind it. Absolutely. And then we never found the resources to actually do it. Absolutely. And as, as you know, probably better than anybody, there are temporal aspects of data. Yeah. So not only having a page that is static, but they are always updating. So no matter what kind of company you are, but particularly in the real estate prop tech and alternative data space, you have firmographic data, that temporal aspect has huge implications for how you get information out in the world. So whether you're creating slides in a presentation or a landing page or an article, you might need to devote a lot of talent or personnel to making sure that content continues to be updated. That continues to be a fairly large pain for people uh, for for companies, and we we in part solve that. Yeah, and uh, it becomes a make or break in SEO. Yeah, absolutely. So the content that we create for for companies uh, on the landing page side is used for SEO. A lot of times it's used to for paid search. A lot of times it's uh, 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 used to launch really sophisticated account based marketing strategies where you have pages that are specific to each of the you know the, the accounts on your target list. So all that stuff, you know, if you you know needs to be pretty scalable. Uh, and as a result, is a really elegant use case for uh, AI or an LLM plus connects to structured data because almost, uh, I should say, much of the content on these pages are very data intense, data heavy. I will want to hear a lot more about the ABM. I think there's a lot that can be done there. 
Um, but first, I'm curious how you stumbled upon this concept and how you began building this. Because yeah. we all know Zillow. We understand their marketing and their data content loop. Yeah. But I think turning that into, into a tech company is not really something you just think about. Yeah, no, I, I think, uh, you know, there are certain companies where, you know, everything just falls into place and there's this grand vision they have at day one. And by day 100, they're off to the races and, you know, day 1000, they're a billion dollar company. That happens sometimes, but I, my, my experience as a founder is not that at all. Uh, my experience as a founder is having a vague idea that uh, the world needs something and ever so slightly making sure that you're, uh, sorry, uh, uh, over the course of time, getting closer to solving that problem. So our story is like pretty, pretty interesting, I think. And, you know, rather than giving you the 20 minute version, I'll give you maybe the two minute version and then we can dig a little deeper if you, if you want. Um, my co-founder and I, uh, uh, Amir, uh, he and I finished up YC in uh, winter 21. So kind of early 2021. At the time, uh, we had a no code data visualization product. So think no code data viz, New York Times style or Wall Street Journal quality charts, maps, and graphs, out of the box, um, a super high quality auto update, no kind of R or Python required to create those. So, um, you know, what you can think about is like Tableau with pre populated uh, public and private data sources, taking all the data work out of data viz. Um, that product did fine. Uh, in fact, it's still doing fine. Uh, you know, you know, over a hundred publishers use that product to tell stories every day, a lot about real estate, COVID, the economy, the jobs report, so on and so forth. And, you know, while that was going fine, there was a piece of feedback that we always got from both our customers as well as prospective customers. So for the prospective customers, it was a lot like reasons why they didn't choose us. And it was like, Hey, we love your software. It's super cool. But it's like 20% improvement in what we do. What we really want is an 80% improvement in what we do. And I said, okay, so what is that like? I said, you give us visuals. We want text. We want the whole damn thing complete. We want the text and visuals so that the blog post, the article, the landing pages is completely done. Because right now I've got to still pay somebody, smart person, to put together most of it. So it's not really transforming the way we work. So we filed that away. Obviously, there's themes that develop. If you're actually listening to your users, you're listening to your customers, which all founders should really spend a lot of time doing. Um, you know, we kind of filed that away. Lo and behold, about a year ago, uh, you and I, and probably everybody who ever might listen to this, uh, you know, the world changed. Uh, GPT was introduced and OpenAI kind of created the, the craziness that we all see and, you know, all the revolution that is kind of happening right now. And... We were in the right place at the right time. We were already in the content generation business. We were already creating a lot of content, uh, mostly with visuals. And what we were then able to do is invest a lot of time and effort and you know engineering time into layering in LLMs, uh, AI, uh, into um, the content we were doing. So in a nutshell, what we were able to do is merge LLMs, as you and I both know them today, with our data, data visualization business to help people, enterprises, companies, publishers, and others create really high quality, sophisticated content that runs the gamut all the way from landing pages to blog posts to parts of offering memorandums. And that has helped us really kind of take advantage of what's happening in the market and grow really, really, really fast. So, uh, so basically GPT-3, the launch of GPT-3 was when you decided okay that's uh, the second part is also doable like i can yeah I mean, get to these clients yeah i mean y y y here's a really rudimentary example like people are like okay you are powering you meaning data herald you are powering hundreds of articles right now for us every day like literally mm -hmm. we power hundreds of articles that probably nearly millions of people read and right now all you're all we're doing is the visuals what we tried to do was template to text, you know, like literally text that says, and then you can say up or down and, and like, it, it's pretty shitty. It sucks. It like, it kind of sucks. It's not, it's not like something I was proud of. So, but yes, as you're saying, as you mentioned with the introduction of GPT, like that, that world changed. We were able to kind of connect the structured data, feed it in, you know, work in conjunction with LLM to create uh, good, good content. Not only media, I want to be very clear. So that history and media is absolutely clear. 
but now actually our customer base is very diversified a lot uh, in uh, prop tech and, and real estate which is a very data intense business mm -hmm. um and frankly it's a customer segment a customer vertical that is desperate because they spend so much time personnel costs are so high to utilize data mls data and other sorts of real estate data to create content they spend a lot of time doing it so it's one of those things if you can harness ai it's transformative to the business margins increase and in fact personnel is happier because takes away in part of the groundwork that they've been doing for a long time and we could talk more about that so give me give me a simple example of how prop tech companies use data herald and how that helps them do what yeah uh, so I'll give you two examples. Um, uh, I'll give you one that's very similar to what you and I were talking about five minutes ago, kind of landing pages. And I'll give you a more interesting example where really deep understanding of the persona, the, the, the person and their workflow and like how that is going to be transformed. So um, one example is, uh, let's say you are a property management company. So we work with a couple property management companies and you want to um, generate interest in your property management software. And uh, uh, you want to um, you capture search, but you know that search is done very geographically. You know, people are looking for terms that might be city specific, zip code specific, county specific, but some hierarchy of geography. In order to do well in that world, you're not going to capture terms at the nationwide level. You're going to really get smart and know your geographies and understand how searchers could potentially find you. So it's a kind of classic sort of SEO or even page search, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the way you do that uh, is in, in part similar to that Zillow example, but getting very, very specific. So creating hundreds, thousands of landing pages. This property manager was able to create content, once again, entirely merging AI plus structured data to create you know thousands of landing pages uh, where people could find them. Here's another example. We work with a company called Ownwell. Ownwell is an awesome company run by a gentleman named Colton Pace. They're based in Austin. They uh, uh, really focus on property tax. Their goal is to help people, uh, homeowners like myself, manage property tax and ultimately many, many things about your property, um, uh, but really reduce your property tax. So in many different areas, your uh, uh, home values are going down and your property tax should actually go down, not up. Dirty little secret. And similarly, they wanted to help homeowners such as myself discover them in many, 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 many places. So we were able to use AI plus proprietary data that they had, that they had worked hard to generate. And supplement, we supplemented that data with a bunch of other data sources to create, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of landing pages that are going to help them grow. And that, that content, those landing pages can be used for search, but also power many different types of marketing motions. Um, those are two examples. I'm happy to give you one more, but why don't I cost effect to you? No, I, lo I love the second example, especially because, uh, it, it's something I, I spend a lot of time thinking about and I'm, I'm sure you do as well. Um, I think we had the era where you had to churn out a lot of content and then you get some ranking in, in Google. Yeah. And I think now what we as users like to see and even what the search engines like to reword is some sort of unique insight into an answer yeah. which okay for very qualitative questions what's the meaning of life what makes you really good at chess blah 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 you have the quora version of that but for like how is this market doing or like what should i pay for a house in this neighborhood or uh more quantitative questions I think there's the real, there's a lot to be done and, and not enough has been done in using a data asset and putting the, the typical SEO tactics and the typical SEO content on top and creating like unique versions of that with an insight only you have. And it's something even, it shocks me that the large data players don't really do that. You don't see Bloomberg landing pages with like, how's the SaaS world doing today? Yeah. And they've even voluntarily given all that traffic to Google, right? Like, how's this stock doing today? And what should I, like, uh, Google Finance yeah. landing pages. But I think we're yet to see the, the real examples of that. And 
Absolutely. Why do you think that is? What's your what's your what's your hypothesis that I could ask? I think there's a consensus that data is scarce. That's been accepted. If we go back to the Bloomberg example, that's especially, of course, everybody in Bloomberg is completely convinced of this. But then all their clients have been for decades convinced that this day, this type of data is really scarce. And so the consensus is that you wouldn't even expect to find it for free and just Google for it. Yeah. And I think like it's one industry where it's really hard to make it from zero to one. Like it's like, it, it, think of your client, your second example, mm. they need to go and compete on all marketing channels with Zillow and not only with Zillow, but like two or three other big names for every type of marketing. And it's not direct competition for sure. Um, but it's really hard for them unless they have some really smart tools and like five years ago would have been impossible to generate any relevant content or dynamic ads unless they work a lot or put a lot of money into it. And so with time, um, I think in all types of data, you, you get, you, you create all, almost like barriers so high that you almost become uh, an oligopoly <laughs> and marketing is reserved for the super rich in an industry yeah. and or in a type of niche. Yeah. But I think that's that's changed a lot now. A lot. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And um, I loved your example because it shows like a like a small business owner uh with the right tech with, at the right time finding this angle and making it work, which is um gives me hope. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There's one more example that I think is interesting that I think the future, that I think tells more about the future, which is, um, so this is kind of more larger company now. Um, right now, if you work at a residential real estate brokerage, uh, you, uh, you need to get your name out a lot. Thought, thought leadership, that comes through many forms. Uh, I know some of them. I don't know all of them. One of them is market overviews, like making sure that you're helping your agents who you know have an agent relationship yeah. with a brokerage, um, kind of look smart, connect with the Rolodex of people, uh, you know their their own their own network, and time to time, and hopefully more often than not, you're creating really high quality content and equipping your agents, which is the tentacles you have into the world, your extension into the world, uh, with that with that content. A lot of times that is market overviews uh, and like stuff that has really nice pictures and stuff, but. It is stuff that draws upon pretty well-baked data sources that you and I and everybody in the industry knows. So when you can understand exactly how people at those organizations, on the marketing teams, affiliate marketing teams, generate that type of content, you know where they click, you know what their pain points are, and generate a workflow that really understands the tools they use and supercharging or turbocharging that creation process so that it's not only faster, but it is higher quality. That is transformative. That is transformative. So that's kind of the, the next evolution of this is getting specific into the types of content at the enterprise that are created. And using that as a jumping off point, you can really see in the future how a lot of different types of knowledge workers, you know, I started my career as an investment banker, uh, it, you know, a lot of the content I created is going to be more easily done, at least not entirely, but 60, 70, 80% done to get the ball rolling, so to speak, with, with AI. So talking about, you know, uh, you know, capital markets, what's going on, and all that stuff is from well-baked data sources, and everybody, every bank uses the same thing uh, and being able to tell the stories. And there's plenty other ways to compete. I'm not saying the whole world is going to look and feel the same, but some of these items will be table stakes and then there'll be competition on the shit that actually matters and that humans will own humans will get good at and there'll be more kind of clear hopefully comparison of quality uh enterprise versus enterprise that's one of the things that that excite me a lot about uh generative ai when you pair it with the adoption of data what i'm uh -huh. imagining I, i'm a mckinsey report addict since forever okay, okay. I'm, 
some of them are wrong, but I even like I, I read the ones that try to predict really far into the future with a lot of interest, just trying to understand the methodology and what the thought was. I'm not trying yeah. to read it as an oracle. Nobody knows what's going to happen, but I'm trying to read it as a hypothesis. Sure. And I love doing that. And one of the things, uh, I living in Romania, I don't get to read a lot about the the geographical area where I'm at or like the problems I really know intimately first person. And one of the things that I've, I've always thought like it would be really cool to have this, this type of like thought leadership and attempt to predict the future happen on a really long tail, uh, but maybe long tail from two perspectives, like long tail ah. from each perspective and long tail from the geography from a geographic perspective, not not only on the very large issues. And I think this one of the things that make me really excited. Like I think we're we're maybe a couple of years away from seeing it actually happen, both from uh um access to data, better tools to analyze, and then be able to put together um sort of draft analysis made by the AI that then somebody with good understanding of a market or a specific niche. So you think that the limiting factor right now for covering long tail geographies, let's say like Romania or parts of Romania is like personnel, like you just can't cover every geography in a granular manner. And again, nobody, <laughs> nobody wants to be a specialist in a topic that only 10,000 people care about, yeah. right? Yeah, absolutely. Look, and look, and you know, to take this back to more industry and kind of what's happening in the industry, I think this is why the applicant, you know, there's a lot of platform technology, we're not that, we're not a platform technology we're applications, but this is why like there's like right now is a great time to be an entrepreneur. Like I'm not saying we're going to make it for sure or anybody else, but like I will tell you there are different applications with different verticals, with different personas. There's going to be hundreds and hundreds of them that are building on top of these technologies in really unique ways with their own moats. Like the more specific you are, the more of a defensibility you can build in. Like if I was just focused on, let's say real estate, which is what we are, like our moat is usage. It's understanding when people type in a prompt, what the intent is and being able to, in a smarter and smarter way, connect it to the right data sources. And as a result, spitting back out better content, text and visuals, like that is going to happen across the board in every vertical for every persona. Uh, and that's where the fun is. And great entrepreneurs will do that fast and will make mistakes, but they'll make them fast. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think we're going to see a brute force of every niche version 3.0 of every type of software and some really spectacular changes will happen. Yeah. And if I could flip the tables for just a second in your neck of the, like, you know, sometimes I think we all, we all live in our little bubbles. I, I surely do both kind of in the U.S. It's hard to be, something that's hard to be a global citizen because a lot of the media you listen to, music, movies is like, it's all English. It's all like a lot of it's Hollywood. Uh, but also like in tech land and I live in not San Francisco, but in LA where there's a lot of tech. So I feel like I live in a bubble and it's, you know, you really have to be proactive to like understand what the real world is seeing in your neck of the woods. And I'm sure you live in your own sort of bubble. We all do, but like, what, what is the perception from common people onward to like AI? What does it mean? Is there a fear? Is there not a fear? Tell me about that. So I, I think that's a really complicated question um, because I'm not I'm not sure how to do the average of, of all the opinions, but I can give you two or three examples at complete different ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Uh, I showed ChatGPT to my dad recently. Oh. <laughs> okay. He's a well-educated guy and a bit of a philosopher. He's an introvert and always like thinking things through and like, trying to come up with really educated opinions on stuff. And I knew exactly how to bait him. I asked him if he can name three things that will always and forever be uh, human and will never be replaced by software. And he mentioned things like uh, creativity and uh, like humor. And then I opened ChatGPT and showed examples of like the AI replicating exactly. I, I, I think it's completely counterintuitive. It was to us as well. It's almost better at those things that should only be human. Interesting. Do you remember the prompt or like, what did you use in, as an example? I, uh, so the, the first, the first one I asked, um, I asked uh, ChatGPT to 
uh, just write a short uh, ballad with his name and the specific day we were at and <laughs> and then uh the company he works at um my dad works in in oil extraction and i asked chat gpt to write it's a public company i just asked chat gpt to write like a short ad uh relevant for the company and and he was like shocked you could see like his face like blood living leaving his face completely yeah. yeah and and then i i started making some jokes with chat gpt and then it knew the answer and like had uh and knew to knew how to throw the jokes back and so on and he was in complete shock and he said um i'm i'm sorry you need to see this during your lifetime uh, he was almost wow. told that uh, that he's old when this comes up as the world is like he he was so his his reaction was fright not delight. Sure, it was a fear of how much the world is changing all of a sudden. Then, uh, uh, hmm. do you think that's age dependent? Because like if I was if I got that, I think I'd be like, oh, that's 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 pretty cool. I think GPT-3 was pretty cool. Yeah. And GPT-3.5 and GPT-4 are sort of like, they're frighteningly good. Yeah. 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 Um, I I did do a bit of thinking and like reading, and I'm sure you have as well. Like there are certain things that will be human. And I think the idea, I think for people who are glass half full, meaning optimists about, you know, AI optimists, um, I think the general uh, consensus, if you will, if I could, is that AI will do the things that you don't want to do, right? And I can think about so many actions and work streams in my career. And I've had a weird career at government and NGOs and for-profit tech and not tech um, that I don't want to do, that I would never do. So that is always like do things that you wanted to do anyways. And I think there are a variety of things that I think humans can only do. I think it's interesting to talk about that. Like um, I was reading somewhere, uh, caretaking, like elderly caretaking, things that need a human touch. I don't think AI or a robot or anything like, you know, whether it's end of life or, you know, surgery on your knee, I think caretaking will be there. Um, I think when you are frightened and you go to a doctor's office, even if the doctor is referencing AI, through a Google Glass or some other manifestation of it, who knows? Um, you as the patient are going to want the human touch that only a doctor, a good doctor, can deliver. Um, I think certain parts of motivation, even if informed by AI, the delivery of motivating a group of people and true kind of leadership, which is unifying people towards a common goal, uh, will leverage AI, but will be driven by, by a human and the focus on the delivery and the human component will be there. Those are a few things kind of that come. Like Obama had somebody that wrote his speeches for him, but, but it needed to be. I mean, delivered. nobody is the orator that, I mean, Obama is a freak of nature. <laughs> well, he's just a freak of nature. And it's just like, Obama is Obama. I don't think because he like had the best speech writer, although he did, uh, I forget what that guy's name is, but man, somehow what he said, his cadence, his timing was just good. I don't care what politics you have. It's just so good. Yeah. But, uh, we're in 2023 and, and the list of things that were still certain they're a hundred percent human is growing shorter. <laughs> yeah, seriously. And that has to be both exciting and, and frightening a bit. Yeah. Yeah. And also like, I don't think that too often there's like this, uh, I don't know, binary or bimodal is the right word, but like placing of people that you're either love technology or you hate technology or you're either a Luddite or you love tech. Actually, I think there's tech I like and there's tech I don't. AI happens to be something that I'm pretty optimistic about. I don't know how you regulate around it. It's going to be one of the hardest regulatory exercises or problems because you don't even know where it's going like you can regulate innovations in solar technology okay you can generally 
regulate that, uh, how to do investment on behalf of the government, where the government stays in and in and out of investment. You can regulate and think about the right place for government and, and the private sector. This one's harder. Like, I don't even know how to attack the problem. But I do think, uh, yeah, I'll pause there. And um, so definitely I, I am both for regulating AI, but I have no idea how will somebody go about it. I, I think we need to iterate about it, uh, like start iterating on it quickly and start figuring out what the framework needs to be. But I yeah. go don't wish to be in, in the shoes of, of whoever has the first take. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I, I'm a fan of a guy named Bill Maher. Bill Maher's a U.S. comedian based in L.A., and uh, he does a show on Friday. He's very politically incorrect, so I don't know if this is like the best place for it. But anyways, the point I'm bringing up, he had Elon Musk on, uh, on uh, to, to interview. And as you might know, Elon Musk was one of the several or dozens of very influential people that said pause on AI. And like, it was a short interview, but like Elon Musk is a really smart guy. It was never clear, and I don't think it's clear. I don't think anybody has any clarity on like how you regulate. So let's say we pause like, Okay, like what what happens? Like I don't, it, I don't think it's ever been articulated, even in that kind of public letter, like exactly how to do it. And uh, tough problem. Well, I I think it's trying just trying to sound an alarm an alarm through whatever means. Yeah, yeah, and coming back to our day to day jobs, uh, how do you think? this revolution we're, we're seeing, how do you think will impact the value you deliver to clients, how users discover content, how people interact with content, how we re read reports, how SEO uh, works and, and so on. Or how do you think about that? Yeah, uh, I mean, the really high level for me, and this is probably an interesting discussion, is this is all future of work stuff. Um, I think when I was growing up and you know, even before, you know, my childhood was, there was really this um, manufacturing jobs in the U.S. Uh, were diversified away, went offshore, uh, went to cheaper labor countries, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, AI is all about, I think, at least as far as I see it, our company attacks it or uses it. It's about um, kind of white collar professional services jobs. So I think it's going to have huge, huge, huge implications for how everybody does their job. You saw Sequoia do their um, investment in Harvey. There's many, many sort of AI for law. Harvey's the one that I know because Sequoia backed it. Uh, but, you know, expediting legal research, which means then the fundamental model of a lawyer, which is like five, seven, eight, nine hundred dollars an hour is going to change because you know that that job has to get done faster. So how the pricing model works, I don't know, but it's changing that industry. Um, I began my career as a banker where I would do some bespoke custom slide creation for a client. Um, and now when I look back, much of those market overviews or, you know, what are public equities markets like? How many IPOs are there? All that content is just going to be a button. It's going to be based on what template the analysis should be done. You're connecting the LLM with structured data, whether that's from FactSet or Bloomberg or wherever else you get it from. And that's going to be completely done. Uh, I think that'll be a happy moment for many analysts who are sleeping under their desk right now. Uh, <laughs> on, and then, you know, we work in, we do a lot of work with real estate companies. And if you're a commercial real estate broker and you're an analyst and associate there, you're spending a lot of time on updating content slides about what's happening in specific markets, what the vacancy rates are, what the uh, cash and cash returns are. And that stuff is going to change too. Uh, don't even talk about like consultancies like McKinsey and Bain and not all, but some of the work, some subset of the work that they do that can be entirely automated. So it's going to disrupt all forms or many different industries, but this time it's going to be largely, I think, white collar professionals and stuff that we generally regard as value add. And uh, I think that's really interesting. You know, one things I was kind of joking around is when I went to college, so I'm, I'm now 39 years old. And uh, when I went to college, it was always computer science major, computer science major. That's where, that's where you should. But they well, right? 
Sorry? The safe one, right? Yeah, the safe one as dictated by expected value, you know, yeah. uh, of income. And like, I don't know what it's going to be like in five or 10 years. I don't, I'm not one of those people who sees binary. I never see binary outcomes. It's not going from one to zero. Never. Um, but, you know, hopefully one of the positive consequences here is a renewed interest in the classics philosophy, truly like liberal arts education, because you don't necessarily need to know how to, how to be the best coder to be great. And I think a lot of people who are graduating from some of the best colleges right now, there's such an intense focus on business and CS. And I think there's actually something about learning how to think about problems that is actually lacking from graduates of the best schools because there's been such an intense focus over the last 20 years on CS, 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 CS. And maybe there's positive outcomes there. Yeah, a lot a lot of the work that goes into things like programming, um, well, most junior level coders, they merely know how to speak a language, how to write a query, speak the SQL language or whatever. Sure. Um, and in a way now it's like that part now done. Like all of us can speak the SQL language without speaking the SQL language. And it's almost like back to basics and what you used to make a very good coder, right? Like very strong logic. And I think that applies to understanding markets as well. It's not so much how you gather the facts and how you filter and build your pivot table. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's how you really understand and break down niches and like are able to build your hypothesis and basically back to strong thinking. Yeah. And so I agree with that. And I think exactly the way you articulated that over the last 20 seconds is going to be true. And you could apply that same last three sentences you said to everything. To, uh, <laughs> to just because you were great at using Westlaw or LexisNexis now doesn't make you the best attorney uh, or the best legal researcher. I, I don't think I'm not an attorney, but there might be other things that you have to compete on. And I think that's interesting. I think healthcare is interesting because I think doctors almost like, you know, mm -hmm. generally speaking, are like bad with humans. Like they're great at medical knowledge, but they're bad at actually like connecting with people. So maybe doctors will compete on not the vast amount of medical knowledge you need and the application of that knowledge to the particular use case. They might have to compete on, Florin, I'm going to connect with you today and solve your problem. Make sure you feel heard. Make sure you know what you're doing when you walk out of my office so that you can take care of your body or whatever it might be. And that's a good outcome. Well, my problem, back to my dad's point, <laughs> that's the thing that schools are typically really bad at teaching what and we're gonna be the generation that sees this weird like species of doctor that tries to learn a bit of social skills and it's a bit angry at the technology and we're gonna see this weird period until schools adapt and, and people adapt their their mindset switching from what used to provide value and I, I, it was more towards the superficial stuff that the exams were built around. Sure, sure. To what that means. But bring your dad back into that. So how does your dad apply? So my dad is just, was just shocked at the amount of adap uh, adaptation we need to do. Uh, yeah, yeah, I get that. And I think there's initial fear there. And maybe very valid. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Maybe fear is the right thing. That well, there's a saying, I forget where it comes from, but then it says something like, uh, nobody wants to live interesting times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, coming back to our, uh, uh, coming back on topic. Uh, sure. You mentioned earlier, I want to take you back um, like 20 minutes in our conversation. Uh, we we left the topic uh, open and said, well, we'll come back to it. Hmm. You mentioned using content for ABM, and I'm really curious uh, how people are doing it and, and what, what you see working and what doesn't. ABM has been a huge buzzword for a while, and most of the people I know have very mixed results, so it's a lot in the implementation. So I'm really curious uh, what works and what doesn't in the implementation and how people are going about it. Yeah. So... Uh, what I can talk to you about is 
how we are uh, enabling organizations to pursue that style of growth. And I think the best way I can explain it, it has to do with kind of the kind of high level and then I'll work, work, work down. At the high level, when you want to do things at scale, it takes some automation, right? I know that's a general statement, but I think it's the foundational element of it. It takes some automation. So if you have a prospect list of 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 and you want to give those and and you want to uh, give those organizations or whoever you're targeting at those organizations unique content, you need to be able to leverage some automation. Um, so whether you are creating unique landing pages, as you probably know a lot about, given kind of the firmographic nature of your data and the work that you guys do, you can now create real uh, 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 unique content that is data heavy. So it has the enterprise use case. It has charts, maps, and graphs, and you could pull in industry data, whatever industry you're dealing with. And you can kind of statically regenerate those pages whenever you want, whenever the underlying data updates. So what you're able to do now is load in 500 or a thousand companies as a data source, combine that using whatever identifiers you want with other sorts of data sources, whether that's location-based, other firmographic data that might come from your company, whatever you want, that doesn't matter. Work in concert with the LLM to create text that makes sense uh, and visuals that make sense and provide that to that organization and whatever it could be. I was talking to a guy. He said, you know what we want to do? I said, what? He says, I'm going to a conference next week and I'm going to hand out water bottles. Okay. Why are you telling me that water bottles? He said, we're going to have a QR code on the water bottle. And I said, okay. He says, I want to hand out unique water bottles to every single person and the QR code will take them to a page that already gives them the application of our technology for their business. And he says, everybody is going to be at this particular conference, the QR code. Can you create content for me for every single water bottle? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I think we could do that. Do you have a list of the companies? And, you know, we're embarking on that project. So that's one classic sort of, or not classic, I should say, but making sure that you're providing the right content to the right people at the right companies at the right time. And that is pretty new now. Old concept, new technology to leverage, I should say. Okay, help help me out a bit with uh, with specifics. So you start, you have a list of a thousand prospects. Mm -hmm. You can kind of guess or enrich your data so that you cluster them together or or mm, derive some sort of list of interests. Right? Let's say they're interested in more in this type of data or this type of insight or this type of service, and then you pre-generate the content, you make the dynamic pages specific for them? Yeah. So let's say you're trying to sell to Airbnb and you know Airbnb uh, might use your particular technology in a particular way or there's an Airbnb in a different country which has a different set of problems and a different demographic uh, uh, customer base. There are just unique things you can provide on that page so that when the company opens up your page, it's really speaking to them um, even though you're not on a phone call yet. It's all about trying, in, in these use cases, to get to a phone call. So that's really it. It's just like taking different types of data sources that are more applicable to that company on your target list and generating content that refreshes time to time based off of the underlying data sources uh, and going from there. This was actually a contract manufacturing company that I was talking about. So they, they're a contract manufacturing company. They target a bunch of other organizations and they wanted to make sure they had specific pages so that when they were used as a contract manufacturer, um, they could get to that phone call a little bit easier. So for them, it was a lot about products. Like, we want to produce widget X. I honestly don't even remember. And we know that you produce widget X. This is what you can do with us. And, you know, you want to onshore things versus offshore things because, as you might know, uh, there's a diversification of the supply chain happening right now with larger macro situations with China. And onshoring things is a big deal. So they saw a big movement into onshoring, and they wanted to make sure that when they met certain prospects, they were talking about that. Okay, so it wasn't even about the specific spe specialty or specific service they would provide for that niche, um, but a, more of a geographical profile. I think for them, it was about certain cost elements of what it would take to make it worth their while to move part of their supply chain on, on, on shore. Got it. Okay. Take into so account shipping costs and all the other things that are 
yeah. dynamic right now. Right. Okay, I'll, I'll use this um, example to ask a broader question. Sure. Uh, are there specific marketing or content plays that you, you'd love to see more and that data companies or data type of content doesn't do enough of um, things that, mm-hmm. that you look at and say my clients or my prospects, like they really should be doing this and this and I wonder why nobody does. I think localization is probably a concept that comes to mind. Um, there is a lot of spend as people think about their media and marketing strategy that is done to blanket the airwaves, either through network television or otherwise, that is just like very general. Um, now, obviously, I work a lot in prop tech and real estate where there's a local element to what we do. Um, but I just keep on thinking about, uh, you know, the data that's available from MLS and CoStar and all these sort of real estate and prop tech data sources that are not used wisely. So I would just think about localization quite a bit. So if you're trying to educate your audience about trends, at this point in time, there are off-the-shelf tools that can make any piece of content, whether it's that real estate flyer or the slide if you're a commercial real estate broker, that can just be better created with more localized content. Um, We live in a world of short attention spans. I think everybody knows this. There's just things flying at us. So now more than ever, you need to really take a better educated guess about what's going to hook somebody. And I think, you know, it's taking that Google lesson, like we'll prioritize things on search if it provides value. And I think that's actually a good premise. I think that's actually a good lesson is just if you can provide value to that user and provide them with something that's interesting, educational, informative, then you'll do well. And I think one thing is localization. Um, That's perhaps not as general as you're thinking, but that's just very top of mind for me as we Look, I run a small company, like go to market is about these, these sorts of topics. And is it, is this tied in, uh, to what, what you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, you mentioned using a market overview as a content tactic. Yeah. So what we're trying to get into is, um, if you are, let's say a commercial real estate brokerage and 30 to 40% of your P and L is spent on personnel. Okay. And that's probably about what it is generally. I'm not going to say any particular company, but you can look at the 10 Ks of certain companies and figure that out. And you know that a lot of the work there for some, you know, highly paid folks, uh, you know, even at the junior levels is about creating specific types of content and you understand their workflows. You've looked over their shoulder. You've seen where they spend time at night doing things. Um, And you can now say there are portions of that just portions, not taking the human out of the loop. I want to like really get away from it. That's like some pipe dream that a lot of people think that you're going to fully automate everything. That's not our world. That's not what we're seeing yet. But we're getting you from zero to 60, 70, 80% super fast. So this idea of a market overview section, you could talk to many folks in commercial real estate. They hate it. It's kind of the annoying thing you have to do. You have to write like, what are the 10 greatest things about Fort Lauderdale, Florida? You know, like, eh. Uh, But now you can kind of create those types of things very, very, very fast. And that is um, alleviating a pretty large problem for companies. So once again, it's in the workflow, specific types of content that have inordinate benefits um, with, you know, these early applications. Yeah. And traditionally the, the hard part about doing this was actually coming up with the ideas as to what you need to write now that whole part became a lot easier and now the 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 heavy part is how you add your own insight or your own data or your own proprietary something to that content so coming up with the 10 lists of the 10 things about fort lauderdale became basically uh automated writing the bulk of the, of each of the 10 things in the 10 articles also became automated. Now making that actually relevant and like coming up with the angle that only you can have, or like the insight that only you can have, or the piece of knowledge that only you can have. I think this is 
where the game's at and and yeah i'm i'm guessing that's what your your you help your clients do yeah i'm this is a real example so when you try to sell a building there's these documents you put together and one inevitable portion of that document is like the top five things about fort lauderdale or whatever the location is and like <laughs> there it it's kind of hard <laughs> I mean, if you're trying to do these rapidly, it's kind of hard. And it, it's exactly like you said. You can now get to a pretty good place with certain tools, AI, um, underpinned by data sources. I think that's our secret sauce is we make LLMs work well with certain types of in-house proprietary third-party data sources so that its ultimate recommendation to get you to 70 80% is rooted in some analysis and data. And that's exactly what it is. Um, now, ultimately, they're not going to hit publish on it right off the bat, but they're going to take a look at it, refine it, put their own insight on it, but it's going to get out faster. Yeah, and it's still probably not going to be for another decade or two completely automated. Like, what's the point of it? What, why would you want that? <laughs> you know, I think the Pareto principle is something I live by a lot. It's the 80-20, right? And I think to get to 70, 80% of where you need to go maybe takes 20, 30% of the effort. To get to 100% effort, look, I I don't know. I don't know. And um, we'll see in the next five years. Uh, but things are getting better. But I think at the end of the day, there is going to be table stakes is going to be leveraging the tools to get you faster. But maybe where you truly differentiate and compete in the market is you're that lawyer, that legal research example is, you can do the research, but then your analysis and your slant on it is what separates you from, you know, satisfactory to the best. Yeah, I, I've kept um, for the last part of our uh, discussion today, I've kept a couple of questions about Data Herald. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated about any sort of data content loops or content flywheels. Ah. And so I wanted to ask you, I think, because specifically, like you, you have a very interesting role of doing that for your clients, but then also doing that for yourself and, and generating an effect that client number 90 will get a much better data asset than client number five. And so it's building it for them, but building it for for Data Herald as well. I was curious, you also mentioned earlier that um, your mode comes from becoming better with every query and how to connect better data to each query and so on. I was curious how that works and, and also how, how you envision this happening in the future and what will change and what won't. Yeah. Yeah. So this is all happening in real time, I think. Um... In tech land, particularly those who are building applications on top of, you know, platform technologies, which is generally what we do. You know, we are not open AI. We are not building, you know, a new LLM, but there are other companies doing it, but it's all about um, the application. It's about, well, how do you protect yourself? You know, just because electricity has been introduced to humans doesn't mean everybody can't just use electricity, which is, you know, the analog that I use for AI, right? Like, we're all going to use it. It's all going to, it's going to impact every part, part, part of our life. Um, and it's like, okay, as you build a business around it, even if you build something that's great today, how do you make sure it's protected tomorrow? So that's a moat, that's a defensibility for, for folks who are, you know, that's not ultimately clear to And, you know, for me, there's a few different places. And I think most people, have, I think agree is usage is the moat, right? You were going to move towards data in the loop. And that's the data flywheel that you, that you talked about. So as people interact, those sort of rich interactions with data herald with your product um you you are in essence interacting conversing with your user and that is feedback that's either coming explicitly by like hitting a you know a thumbs up thumbs down that you've probably seen or other sorts of are they copying the data or the visual are they using it and you can track that in, in a number of ways those are conversations you're having with your user and that ultimately is a really rich data source that provides the defense of building the moat because then you're ultimately 
providing people with a better product because you know what not to give and what to give them. And that's getting refined. Old. Well, actually, we've already seen this. Like it's still early, right? We're, it's still very early, but at scale, this is this is where you get better. And I think we all have experiences of that when, I don't know, like think about this. When you write in Gmail right now, like where it adds your next three, four words, when they first introduced that feature, it was okay. Now they're like, right? Full sentences almost. Uh, you know, it's just like, that's the simple, I think, idea that's that's happening here uh, in some sense. And so if I understand correctly, you're looking at the content you're publishing or your clients are publishing as a sort of search and you try to identify what the success criteria is, what makes this particular user have a successful search, right? And close that feedback. Or content that we're creating. So we're, we're giving a user text and visuals. You are writing with a one or two sentence prompt. I want to compare the housing prices of this zip code versus that zip code over this time frame. Okay. And uh, that one's a pretty easy one, uh, but there's actually more complex one. And we are interacting in some sense with the user to figure out whether or not we were accomplishing their goals. All right. And that's the conversation or the interaction that you're having with your user. To get a little bit more specific, ultimately we're connecting a user with several different databases and we're trying to understand the intent of the prompt with a different database. Um, over the course of time, as you process more prompts through those conversations, quote unquote, with the user, you're going to be able to connect to the right data at the right time. So that's another play for us. And ultimately give them better text and visuals and data uh, uh, from the, uh, for their prompt. So for you, what you're measuring to make sure you're making progress is, am I doing the right query? Am I understanding the prompt of the user correctly? And can I break it down so that I can make a better query next time? So, something like that, right? Yeah. Intent. Sure. Yes. Yes. In short, I want to make sure we're understanding what it is. Like, um, here's another example. Well, you know, what is the, actually, I'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think I understand. I, I, you're, I, I'm sure it, it gets a l really complicated with real life examples. Yeah, and actually, but how you're all going. Sorry. Your, your challenge is that you have hypothetical content because <laughs> you not only compare with what you've done in the past or sim how you've treated similar queries and am I now at 19% success rate versus 17 last month, but what are all the other potential queries that I could be making right now? And like, am I under, am I basically, am I breaking down the user prompt with a bias or without a bias? Yeah, absolutely. And I think you of all people might understand then why it's important to, in the early days, uh, be vertically focused, meaning narrow on a particular industry. It, yeah. it actually makes the problem easier to solve. 100%. Because you are going to have a lot of experience with a lower number of data sources, databases, and then are developing expertise faster and separating yourself from the pack faster in that vertical. So it has part to do with our go-to-market and why we have some initial focus, even though the underlying idea and technology are merging LLMs with data sources, databases, and data visualizations can be applied to almost any category. Once again, we're seeing this at Harvey, which is the uh, 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 AI for legal startup that we talked about. But the vertical focus makes a lot of sense. Funny enough, our first client, uh, before we launched anything automated uh, for a year or two, we were just a services company. Okay. Uh, basically, data mining on demand. Um, and our, our first, uh, client was a YC company that was a sort of, uh, pre Harvey Harvey. <laughs> oh, really? The technology wasn't that big. They were building, it was called Ross intelligence. It's really interesting. Uh, they were building basically, a, a, an interactive chat with an LLM on top of, uh, Westlaw like databases. Yeah. I mean, I, that it's a really great idea. As you know, sometimes timing is everything. Well, sure. You have the right idea, but if the timing is wrong, then you were just wrong. 
Oh, well, funny enough, it should be up, but they, they got sued into oblivion. <laughs> they got what? They got sued into oblivion. Like, they they had um, large large competitors started uh, suing them. Mm. Like Westlaw and LexisNexis. Yeah, and it's a conversation I'm sure we'll have on on every niche right now, like, who is the content? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, like, in a lot of this stuff, there's obviously technical barriers to, to how you build and all that stuff, but I actually see a lot of just go-to-market and um, how you go-to-market, some of the licensing for data. Um, and then, as we talked about a little bit earlier, you've got to think about moats in this business. Look, I'm, I mean, as you and I talked about, like, you know, I funnel raising. And, um, you know, it's a question I get a lot from potential investors as well. Uh, and like, we, we think we know, and we think it's very obvious, but like, this is a question that everybody is thinking about nowadays. So some of the technical barriers are actually not the things that come up a lot in conversations, believe it or not. Yeah. That makes sense. It's very, my experience is very similar. Yeah. And, uh, the answer has to have at least a large component of niching your service. Yeah, totally. Totally. Okay, um, I want to end with a question about the future. I'll, I'll leave it open. I just want to understand, Anush, uh, the way you're looking at things today. Where do you want to be in a few years? Where where do you think this is going? If everything goes well, <laughs> where, where do you want to end up? That's a really good question. Um, let me try to structure my thoughts in some way that perhaps ties our conversation together. Um, there, uh, point number one, and then I'll, I'll go from here is I think that technology is generally a good thing and I'm an optimist on technology. So I think that's the overarching idea that I view a lot of the innovations that are happening with AI, which has been, you know, in large part, what we've been talking about as a positive outcome. Like anything else, I will never debate somebody and say there's not potential pitfalls. There are, and I think I have confidence that we either through regulatory mechanisms, you know, self-discipline on the private sector, that such a thing will ho hopefully mitigate those things and talk about the things, uh, you know, the, the benefits will rise to the top. But I think the future is what we spoke about earlier that slowly but surely in nearly every aspect of our industry but actually ironically starting with white collar professionals in legal in consulting in banking in real estate and the list goes on we're going to see a massive change in the way people do work and 30 40 50 years ago was manufacturing and now the time is different it's knowledge work that is going to be changed and it's going to change fast. And I think that's a good thing. If anything we've seen over like the shortage of labor supply in the US, it's that you can maybe automate certain things and allow humans to do better quality work where humans are required. And I think that's a good outcome. And I think that's what we're going to see in the next three to five years in spite of the disruptions that will happen in certain industries, but I think we can, we can move past those barriers and this will be a good outcome. So for us as a company, so ting that macro to the micro for us, we believe that in real estate, in prop tech, there is a massive improvement to be made with how people spend their time. These are not small parts of the income statement. These are 30, 40% of costs. So we think this will, um, be a big change for how people do work. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Anuj. Thank, thank you. That was super fun. Let's do this again <laughs> after you yeah. fundraise. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, thank you. For, thank you for having me. This was this was great. Uh, not often do you get to like get out of the day to day of like solving your own business problems to talk about what the future might hold. Uh, you have to get away from the day-to-day -to, -day to, to try to do that. And this, this was fun for that reason as well. Likewise. Thank you so much.